In this next lecture, we are going to go over writing the keys or keyboard part for our beats. So the drums and the bass are the rhythm instruments, but the keyboards also play an important role for the rhythm, and they also play a real harmonic role in the whole song, because we do get the groove mainly from the drums and the bass, but all the chords and the harmonies really come from the keyboard parts. So learning to play or programming the keyboards is really essential for creating great beats in Logic Pro 10. A thing to do if you don't know too much music theory is to just start off with simple steps like realising the difference between major and minor chords because it will really help in writing music. So the keyboard part has two roles. The first is to lock in with the drums and the bass and the second role is to add a harmonic function. So it gives the whole song a bit of harmony and also adds a bit of colour and texture to our music. Let's first of all find a keyboard sound. This drum and bass sound is quite electro sounding, so let's try and find an electro keyboard sound too. Let's just type in electro over in the software instrument search and see what comes up. Let's try this one. Let's try this one, Electro Laser. For this exercise, I want more of a keyboard part rather than an effect or a synth sound. Let's try Electric Piano because I do think a lot of these electro software instruments more sound effects than keyboard instruments. Alternatively, if you don't want to search through the software instrument library, we can open up the Electric Piano instrument here. And it's Vintage Electric Piano. We can always change this later on, but I think it's good to start with an instrument that is very similar to what you want already, because then it will allow you to write based around this sound. Let's just go through a few of these keyboard sounds. Let's just change the octave. Yeah, this one sounds nice. It's like a whirly Fender Road sound. I think this can work with our track. So similar to writing the drums or bass, for the keyboard part you can either play it in live with your MIDI controller or musical typing, type in the MIDI information or find a loop and manipulate it. I personally like to play the part in live because I do think you can get more ideas performing it in, but that's just the way I like to work. If you're new to writing music, try all the different techniques I give you and find out what works for you as it might not be the same as what actually works for me. Going back to the drums and bass on the track, there are three different sounds. The third section was a breakdown section where there was less going on. There was also the second section where the snare was playing four to the floor, which means a note every beat. And the first section, which was the main groove of the song. Okay, let's just loop the first section. The best thing I find for writing in keyboard parts is just jam it out and play along to the track just to get a feel for what you want to play in. Remember your harmony, you want to ideally have more than just octaves and fifths. You really want to add a third to your chord as well. If you're struggling really to create a chord, it will say up here what the chord is. It says at the moment C minor. If you do know a bit of music theory, you can also add a ninth or an eleventh or even a thirteenth of the chord too. We can see this new name of the chord up here. Jazz up the chords a little bit if you're into that kind of thing. It can make it a little bit more interesting. I would, however, just start with the basic major and minor chords, which is the first, third, fifth and octave of the chord. Like I said, I would just get a feel for the track and try to think what kind of keyboard part would complement this music nicely. So just groove along and don't record yet and just get a feel for the keyboard parts. I like this part I was playing, it adds a lot more colour to the song. Here I'm playing a C minor 9 and a G minor 7 13. I believe this adds a lot more interest and colour than just playing the regular 1st, 3rd and 5th of the chords. 
but it's completely up to you what you do. I always say work to the track. So if you think the track could benefit from having more colorful chords like this, go ahead and do it, but don't just do it for the sake of it. If the track's gonna sound better just having simple chords, just playing simple chords. Okay, now I'm going to record this in. If you make a mistake, you can always just record it in again, or just leave the loop going and record over your mistakes. This new section really does add a much deeper harmonic element to our track. Let's now open up the Piano Roll Editor, Shortcut Command 4, and have a look at these MIDI notes. I have got a few mistakes, so I'll just clean it up. Sometimes when you play these more advanced mm -hmm. chords, you might accidentally hit the wrong notes, but it's really easy to fix minor errors in the Piano Roll Editor. Okay, let's change the quantized time to quarter notes, as these hell notes are a little bit longer, so we can change it from sixteenth to quarter notes. Let's hear this now. So this is the second section. There are two things we can do here for the keyboard parts. We can either think of a new section or just copy over the first section. I'm actually thinking the first keyboard section will fit over nicely in the second section. So let's just drag it over here. Hold down Alt to drag. For the third section, I'm going to hold down a few notes. I'm going to try this chord, which purposely clashes, but I do think it will add tension to this section. It will add a kind of tension and release. So when this section plays, it will hold a lot of tension, and when it goes to another section, it will get released. It's a kind of C minor with an F and a major third. I think this chord will add drama to this section, and I do think it will make it a little bit more exciting as well. Let's just hear this. Let's just quantize this by opening the Piano Roll Editor, shortcut Command 4, and hitting the Quantize button over here. Let's now just hear this back. Let's now copy over the first section for the repeat. If you look here, we actually repeated the third section, but only half the length. Let's just drag over and resize this MIDI information. I believe that this new keyboard part will give a much more mature element to our track as these chords really do add a nice deep harmony and I think it does make the track a lot more interesting for the listener. Let's just hear this track now. It basically just repeats. So this is the technique that I use for writing keyboard parts in my track. I start off thinking of a rhythm that locks in with the drums and the bass, and then I also think of the keyboard as a harmonic instrument and think about adding depth and colour to the track through the note selection and chords that I use. Alternatively, you can go over to the loops over here and manipulate the keyboard loops. If your keyboard skills are a little limited, you can always type in the notes individually in the Piano Roll Editor. Just remember to think about music theory when you do this, things like the chords of the key and the difference between major and minor chords. So in this lecture, we've gone through the keyboard parts and how I write keyboard parts. If you have any different techniques, then please post them in the discussion board. I'd love to hear them. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next lecture. Hi, welcome to this lecture. This lecture is all about microphones. So there's loads of different microphones to choose from, so I thought I'd just do this lecture so you know the main difference between the different microphones and also which microphones might be useful for you to use in creating your own music. 
So there are three different types of microphones. There are dynamic microphones, ribbon microphones, and condenser microphones. And we also get different polar patterns. So we get figure of eight microphones, which means you basically get signal from one side and the other. We get cardioid microphones, which means it's a direction of sound. A little bit at the rear as well, like a heart shape. And we get hypercardioid, which is really directional. And then we get omnidirectional, which is the whole room. So I've just got a selection of microphones here. I thought I'd just show you a few of these and also show you my favourite ones. But first of all, you'll notice that I've got a microphone here. This is a Rode Link lapel microphone. It links to a power pack on the back here. And yeah, this is actually a backup microphone. My main microphone is this one up here. This is a RE20. It's a broadcaster microphone. And for my other lectures, this is the one I've been using for my spoken voice. Another one I use now and again is this. This is a SM7B. This is great for spoken word also. It's also great for male vocals and a lot of hip hop vocals. I know Bono from U2 actually uses this microphone. So this is a really great one as well for voiceovers or male vocals, as well as the RE20. I've got another RE20 here. This is actually one of my favorite microphones to use. It's also great for bass guitars as well. And yeah, it's really, really good for voiceovers. So if you look at um, red, different radio stations, they normally either have RE20 or the SM7B. These are the main ones for voiceovers. Okay, these are both dynamic mics as well. Dynamic mics are generally more durable. They can take a bit more of a beating than definitely ribbon mics and condenser mics. And you don't need phantom power as well, so they don't need any external power. So a ribbon mic is like this one. This is a SE Electronics uh, XIR, X1R, sorry. So this is, I don't really use this often. It's a very fragile ribbon microphone. It's also figure of eight, which means you get sound from one side and the other. And it pr it's really good for picking up bright sounds, but yeah, it's not one that I normally use. There's also this one, which is the T-Bone RM700. This is a figure of eight microphone as well. I use this one a bit more. This one picks up more brighter sounds as well. So it's quite nice. This one's a little bit um, more inexpensive than the SE Electronics. And then we go on to condenser microphones. So condenser microphones are basically kind of, they're brighter than dynamic microphones. They're less fra fragile than ribbon microphones, but still more fragile than dynamic microphones. Um, they are quite expensive, like this mic's probably close to I don't know, $800, $900, maybe more. It's uh, 414. It's kind of the jack of all trades microphone. So you've got all different settings on here. Um, so you've got like a figure of eight. You've got the cardioid. You've got hypercardioid. You've got omnidirectional as well. So basically, if you've got an instrument or a vocal and you want it recording, um, this will do a pretty good job on everything really. So it's pretty decent. I wouldn't use it on like a kick drum. I'd use a dynamic mic for a kick drum because. Um, these are a little bit too bright, but for vocals or certain instruments, a 414 is really good. It is a little expensive, but it is kind of good at everything, really. I've also got a shotgun microphone here. This is also um, a dynamic, uh, this is also a condenser microphone. So this is good for if you're on location and it's hypercardio, which means it points in one direction. So if you're trying to pick up vocals from far away, or if you've got an instrument from far away on location or a live gig, something like this can be really good. It's also a wind muffler, which is good if it's outdoors so it stops the wind sound. And you can get one of these as well, which is basically, basically a stand that goes on here. And that way you can uh, extend it out. So this is for more like movie sets. This is a standard size one, but you can get ones that are even larger. And so uh, let's just screw this on. Another tip is when you're screwing microphones, actually screw the stand, not the mic, because you don't want to be spinning the mic around just in case you drop it. Like so. So you can have it like this and extend it out. Always make sure it's on tight as well. Okay. So yeah, we can uh, extend it out. So this is quite useful if you're doing location recordings. Or if you're doing a movie, you can just extend this out, which is pretty useful. You can rest it on your shoulder or even on your head as well if you're holding it for a while. But yeah, in the studio, I wouldn't normally use this. It's more for on location. 
Okay, the next microphone is this one, a Newman TML. This is really nice for kind of um, female vocals, really bright sounding vocals. I really like this for that. And another one I really like for female vocals is actually the Rode K2. Here it is. So this actually has a valve inside it. This is a condenser mic as well. It has a valve in here and it can create a really nice rich sound. The only downside of this microphone is you've got to carry this box with it as well, which is a little bit annoying. So this basically powers the valve inside the microphone. And so you don't need any external phantom power. Phantom power is basically power from your interface or from your mixer, but this gives the power. I think it's 300 volts it needs. So it needs a lot more than 48, so it goes through this as well. It has its own kind of mic input. And a couple more mics here are Sherp's Omni. So these are great for recording a drum kit or a room sound. These are quite expensive, but they are really nice, the Sherp's. You can get the cardioid versions of this as well, or you can get the Omnis. And for drums, these are amazing. Or hi-hats or cymbals, these are really nice. And also to create a really nice rich room sound, I'd use the Sherp's. Okay, there's also a Shaw SM57. If you're on a bit of a budget, um, yeah, this, this is a really nice mic. It's great for snares, brass instruments. It's kind of a jack of all trade as well. It's a dynamic mic, so it's really durable. Another standard classic dynamic mic is this one. You've probably seen this if you look at any gigs on TV or if you go to any gigs. The singer normally nine times out of 10 has this microphone. It's a Shure SM58. It's really durable. You could probably drop it and it it's more likely to be okay than definitely all the other microphones. It's so durable, it's great for live performance, but in the studio, I wouldn't really use it. But for live, or if you're DJing, any, anything like that, and you want a mic just to grab and put down quickly, yeah, use this. I wouldn't, use, I wouldn't treat a ribbon microphone or condenser microphone like this mic. This mic is a lot more durable. Um, yeah, so that's basically the mics I've got here. But my favorite ones, the RE20. I love this for voiceovers. The SM7B is also great for voiceovers and for male vocals. And also, the SM57 is great for a jack of all trades. And yeah, the 414 is really good as well. Yeah, that's basically a tutorial about the microphones that I use. And it depends on your budget as well. If you've got more of a high end budget, you can get stuff like the K2, the 414. Um, if you've got a lower budget, you can just get that, the SM, um, SM57. Um, and just start off with a few microphones and build your way up. But the first few mics, if you can, I'd start with the SM57, the 414, and maybe the SM7B or the, the RE20. That'll cover the, kind of the bass frequencies, like the kick drum and the bass guitar with the RE20. More like the hi-hats and the cymbals and the snare with the SM57. And basically just anything really, like vocals, the room microphone, the drum kit, whack it on with this bad boy, the 414. There is a ULS and the XLS, this is the XLS. The ULS is kind of the old analog one where you've got switches, you physically have to switch. This is the digital one, which um, I think the, US, the ULS technically sounds a bit better, but it is a bit more fragile and they are more expensive. This one's a bit easier to use as well. And yeah, you've got um, the gain DB on the back as well and Hertz. So this is really good for if you just want one mic, just to record pretty much everything, apart from maybe the kick drum, it's fantastic. Yeah, so thank you for watching this lecture. I hope I've given you a bit of insight to the different types of microphones, and yeah, my favorite mics as well. So yeah, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next lecture. Oh, so, hi. And who? Hey, a special treat today, we've got Mr. Paul Bailey. What a treat. Yeah, what a treat, yeah. He's an engineer, um, from Abbey Road and for York Radio, so as a mix yeah. engineer and producer. Yep, over the years. Yeah, worked with a lot of uh, different interesting people, of uh, fun stories I hope. Oh, one or two. One or two, yeah. If you're lucky. If you could, um, <laughs> so is that about right? So you worked for York Radio and you went on to become a, a master engineer. A yeah, well, well the, uh, the, the Radio York thing was just for a year. Oh, that okay. was my uh, first work after I graduated as a student. Okay. Back in the mid eighties. Okay. Um, and really, well, well, all I did was walked into reception one day and said, "Give me a job." Yeah. 
And, <laughs> and they sort of did, because people didn't do that too often back then. And they said, OK, you can come and do some stuff here. Cause the, I told them what my background was. Yeah. You know, done uh, you know, two music degrees and this, that and the other. And uh, they said, well, you can come and do a few things here, but it's voluntary. Yeah. We're not going to pay you. But after a while, when they suss out that you can actually do a few things, they did start giving me some paid gigs and jobs and things, you know, going out doing Vox Pops, um, operating the radio car, uh, manning the phone on phone-ins, exciting yeah. things like that, doing the early morning shift, arriving at five in the morning, because, you know, you're a bit of a mug. Not many people will do that. Yeah. But, uh, you know, when you've got no money, you'll do anything, pretty True. much. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I did that for a year or thereabouts. And, uh, that, you know, as you do when you're, you know, you just graduated, you think, what are you going to do with your life? And I wasn't sure. I thought, well, I, what I, after is working in a studio, you know, as, you know, a lot of music production students these days want to. So I got a music yearbook and typed about 200 letters or thereabouts you know, on a typewriter. There were no computers in 1985, 86. So you make a mistake, pull out the piece of paper and start again You know, with each individual letter for about 200 of them. And of that 200, I got one positive reply, which is probably about the rate you'd expect now as well. But you only need one. And that was from the head of A&R at EMI Classics, uh, who invited me down for a chat in his posh office in the middle of London. And after 10 or 15 minutes, he said, uh, I don't think you're really looking to work somewhere like this. I think what you're really into is um, working at a studio. I'll, I'll see if the boss of Abbey Road will have a chat with you, who's Ken Townsend. And so he got in touch with Ken and a couple of weeks later, Ken said, come and have a chat, which was great. So I went and had a chat with Ken at Abbey Road and he was showing me around the studio and we walked into the editing rooms. Uh, this was, well, it's 1986. They'd just six months earlier switched over everything from analog to digital. It was that phase okay. of yeah. um, you know, recording history. And he, uh, the head of editing, David Bell, he sat me in front of this newfangled editing device, which we're all very excited about. It looks really clunky now, yeah. but back then it was great. It was like state of the art. And he was editing um, Petrushka, the big score by Stravinsky, a ballet. And he said, right, I'm going to put it into play. And when the music gets to there in the score, I want you to hit that button there. Which is, if you can read music, of course, it's easy. So I did that. And... Obviously, that's what he was testing, whether I could read music. And then the two of them, he and Ken, went into the foyer for a chat and came back a few minutes later and said, uh, do you want a job? So I said, well, thank you very much. That uh, sounds all right to me. So I wasn't going down for a job interview. I was just going down for a chat. I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. Yeah. I suppose it's like making your own luck in a way. Um, one of the other editors had just been shifted sideways, so they had a vacancy, and I just happened to be there at that moment. Oh, right. uh, yeah. Yeah. So I started off there as a uh, classical music editor and you very quickly realise, or at least I did, that if that's all you're going to do, after a couple of years you're going to end up in the lunatic asylum because it's crazy. It's a crazy world, uh, editing classical music. Is that finding the best takes from... Yeah, well, the f that's true. Finding the best... them all together. Yes. Finding the best take isn't the editor's job, that's the producer's job. OK. Um, so what will happen is that there'll be the sessions, whatever the music is, and the producer will then mark up the score, say, you know, from here to here I want this take, from here to here I want this take, and then this yeah. take, and then this take. And then the editor has to chop them all together to make it sound like the music's just been played once and then the musicians have just walked out, which, of course, is the illusion. That's what yeah. everyone is supposed to think. But it isn't actually the case. Uh, so it's you know a real skill really to be able to edit classical music successfully. You have to uh, well, if not actually be a musician, you have to go to concerts a lot, listen to music a lot, know when it sounds right, know when it sounds wrong, you know when a phrase is working. You know when you do an edit, all sorts of things can happen. Because uh, you know classical music is not recorded to a click or anything like no. that. So tempo, 
dynamics, just general feel. Um, if it's complicated music, are you sure you haven't missed any notes out? Or you've doubled up on some notes or something like that. So, um, so you really have to know the score back to front. Oh yeah. Or, yeah. Well, well you, yeah, well, you have to be able to read the score really fluently and, and know if there's something wrong. Um, okay. You don't actually have to know the actual piece of music that you're editing. Although by the end of editing it, you probably will. Yeah. You know, um, but that's the other thing. Uh, because you end up doing so many edits and getting forensic with it, honing in on 10 second chunks, you can get to the end of a whole CD's worth of music and not know whether it was any good or not you know, as a piece of music or yeah, as a yeah. performance because all you've been doing is listening to little Listen to the chunks. technical elements yeah. instead of yeah. and it can listen take... to how it makes you feel, I guess. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so you're listening in an entirely different way when you're editing to when you're listening as a you know, consumer of the music. Yeah. Uh, entirely different way. You're being very technical um, and you're just, you know, making sure everything is just so, just right from a technical point of view. Um, as well as making sure you're over that period of the edit, you know, 10 to 20 seconds on either side, that musically it all works as well and the feel of it is correct. Um, but it can take a week to edit a, a classical CD together, just just the editing part of it, yeah. and then it will come back for re-edits, and maybe edits again after that. Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah. Mm. Yes. Long, complicated yes. process. So yeah, yeah <laughs> it, well, it can be. Uh, a thousand takes on a classical recording session is not uncommon. Yeah. You know, and then you've got to choose of, of that thousand takes which are the ones you're going to use. Yeah. You know, and, and that can take time. Um, so, yeah, because it was the early days of CD, back in the sort of mid to late 80s, I think the first CDs really took off around about 1983, 84, uh, there's, there was a whole back catalogue with all the record companies, but in my case EMI, which needed um, digitising, which uh, was called remastering. Yeah. Uh, so I moved over into that area which was a lot more exciting really because no one had ever done it before so therefore there was nobody to say how to do it what to do what not to do all that happened was that there were two or three of us and we were given sort of recording after recording after recording to get from quarter inch or one inch analog tape sometimes sometimes we went back to the eight track analog tapes but normally it was quarter inch stereo tapes and to get that information off the tape and into a digital format and it sounds very straightforward you should just play the tape and copy it onto digits but there's all sorts of things which you get away with on a vinyl disc that you don't on a cd for example if you're doing a uh, for example a symphony with movements between the movements and, the, and you know, this would apply to any pop album as well. Um, between the tracks, there's going to be leader tape, which um, like that red or white tape. So when you play it in the digital world, the tape hiss will just go shh, blub, 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 okay, yeah. and you're back into the next track. Yeah. And so that sounds rubbish on a CD. So you've got to come up with ways to keep ambience up between movements or between songs. So it just sounds like the background noise is just continuous and you're not drawing attention to it. There's, uh, it's, part, it's part of the human condition. If something in your environment doesn't change, you don't notice it. Yeah, I know a lot of yeah. people, they actually sleep with a fan on. So if you have mm. constant sound, yeah. it helps you go to sleep. And if you have random sporadic sounds, it wakes yeah, people it's, it's up. the same yeah. thing. And it applies to smell as well. If you were fortunate to walk into a pigsty, yeah. it would smell like mad. But after five minutes, you can't smell it. Yeah because it's just part of the environment. You only notice something when it changes. Yeah. Um, so, so you've got to deal with that. Uh, all sorts of other things. Um, analog edits sometimes become more audible in the digital world because on a vinyl disc, there's the inherent noise of the disc masks things. You know, there, there's, of course, the story about you know, whether vinyl discs sound better than CDs. That, that's a whole, a whole other story, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Um, but the fact of the matter is that whether you like the sound or you don't like the sound, uh, there's some problems on tapes which are masked when you listen to it on vinyl disc and are not masked on a CD. It shows everything in all its glory. 
um, audible edits and print through um, where when the tape is wound if there's something loud like a loud chord or a loud drum hit or something that can really um, the, the magnetism of that can seep through onto the bit of tape lying next to it and if that's okay. a quiet bit of music you can like hear a pre-echo um, so when the tape's playing you can hear for a couple of seconds what's coming before it actually comes properly if that makes sense yeah yeah, yeah. good <laughs> yes. um, so you've got to try and get rid of that sort of thing where you can um, back in the 50s and 60s electronic gear wasn't always grounded as well as it is now so you get hum oh, really? uh, mains hum yeah as a regular thing especially if you go back into the 40s um, an early tape well early tape commercially was came in in 1949 but the, and into the 50s 50 hertz mains hum all the time and in america it's 60 hertz um plus the harmonics of course i know you can get plugins that get rid of 40 or 50 hertz yeah, the and harmonics. the harmonics, and then 100, yeah. 150, 200. Yeah. yeah, you can. Um, I've got a couple, but I never use them. I just um, put uh, parametric EQ on as notch filters, make yeah. the filter as narrow as I can. Just find out where it is. Find where it is, yeah. and drop it by the minimum amount necessary to get rid of it. Of course, the more you do it, the more you're creating, you know, aliasing in the filter and distortion. So just drop it by the minimum amount shouldn't ever have to be more than about 10 dBs. But as you go up through the frequencies, it tends to get quieter. So about 200 hertz at minus five will probably do it. Yeah. Still be there a little bit, but not so much as it's going to bother you. Um, yeah, so there's that and rumbly things going on under it. Um, thumps, those sorts of things to get rid of. Dropouts where bits of oxide fall off the tape and create a dropout. Uh, to get rid of those and but yeah you know, which is easy now with the software we've got you can just use retouch or other programs are available yeah. like, like photoshop for audio yeah. and draw out problems uh, but back then you couldn't do that you'd have to either do a little edit to close up the dropout uh, or put a bit of reverb on or something yeah. just to just to hide it so yeah you know, all sorts of problems uh, and then, of course, there's the whole question of do you or do you not EQ and change the sound of these recordings? Because theoretically, you're going to make it sound better. You, well, you, well, that, that's the thing, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So we did. Yeah. yeah. I, I would. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, but some people wouldn't. Uh, sort of the purest elements say, well, it was approved. That master is an approved master. You can't touch it. You know. But we we mm. took a decision early on yeah. that. You know, because the monetary facilities weren't as good back then as they are now, and you can hear more. Therefore, if you can make it sound better, you should. Yeah. At the end of the day, you've got to make the listening experience as good as possible for the listener. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I did that for some time. and uh, But even that, we're starting off that remastering, there were still no computers in the building at all. I think the first computers arrived around about 1990 if memory serves maybe 89 uh, max uh, running sonic solutions and sonic solutions was the digital workstation of choice around the whole world back then oh really it had that okay. market of the whole in the professional world yeah there, there were other programs coming coming along like the early cubase what was that called um there was an early version of cubase um doesn't matter. Not sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Sonic Solutions in professional studios, that they had the complete monopoly of the market. Uh, is, is that still around now? I haven't, it, haven't really heard, haven't heard um, now. it. It's the, not really. There's a program called Soundblade, which is more of a video program, which is Sonic Solutions. Uh, but the problem with Sonic Solutions, as I understand it, really, is they had the whole marketing it was a brilliant program for its time um they took their eye off the ball and these other companies and programs sort of came up on the outside lane you know pro tools yeah. logic um in my world um pyramix sequoia um sadie yeah and um 
Sonic Solutions weren't ready for them, so they got sort of caught out, I think. And all these other programs came along, and that was the end of Sonic Solutions. Uh, but that's that's where we all started. The early computers were stereo only, no graphic displays, so you know, no waveform displays. So it took up too much computing power, really? even in stereo. Still all by ear. Yeah, everything's still by ear, which yeah. of course how you should do it. Yeah. You know. I, uh, I guess you do spend a lot of time just look. Well, I do anyway, mm. just looking at the waves and looking at the information rather than listening to it. Uh, yes, it's, uh, it's a danger, yeah. especially, especially some um, EQ. Yeah. Plugins. Yeah. You know, these nice like graphs yeah. and things. Yeah. You think, oh gosh, yes, I could do with just smoothing that graph line off a bit. Yeah. But it's not how you should do it. Well, you when, do when, it I listen, you... when I listen to my mixer, I make sure I never look at the monitor. So yeah. it always puts me off. Always just look at the. Yeah. Yeah. Very, yeah. The good. Visu the visualizer just distracts you way too much. You never actually end up listening. You're just looking at the mix, which yeah. is music at the end of the day. What I do normally is I'm sort of listening to a mix and I'm sort of. In my head, I'm splitting up the sound into frequency bands. Oh, okay. You know, um, you know, very low, mid low, upper low, then into the mid range. Split that up into two or three bands in my in sort of in my head, sort of between two hundred and eight or nine hundred hertz, and then you know, into your sort of low tops, mid tops, upper tops, and just thinking to myself, is there any sort of band in there which is coming across too strongly or is just not there and then EQ accordingly yeah and that's how I think about it really so, so you know especially in the sort of classical music world where you're aiming for as a natural sort of sound where you know in the pop world you might be after sort of special effects for various things and it's, it's not quite the same way of working um, although sometimes it is um, but in the classical world and the film world um, you're sort of EQing to try and make it sound as natural as you can in an artificial sort of a way. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um. Hi, in this lecture, I'm going to look at recording external synthesizers into Logic Pro 10. So this is stuff like hardware synths or actual physical synthesizers rather than having a synth plugin or a virtual synthesizer. The synth I'm going to demo here is called a MicroKorg XL and it's got two outputs, a left and a right, and it's also got a USB on there as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug the left and right into channel one and two on my interface, which is a Scarlett 2i2 USB interface. It's quite a standard one. And the USB from my MicroKorg XL is going to go direct into my MacBook. Before I record the audio from the synthesizer, I can actually edit and change and quantize the MIDI information that it's going to play. So instead of me physically having to play it imperfectly in time, I can actually write in the MIDI information or play in the MIDI information, edit it, and then get the keyboard to re-record this perfectly in time. It's not just the timing you can do, you can also edit the velocities and the mod wheels and the pitch bend wheels. So if you've got some hardware synths and you want to actually have them in your songs, instead of you having to play it perfectly in time or having to flex or quantize the audio, you can actually do it this way and get the synths and the modulation the velocity is exactly how you want them. So first of all, let's select a software instrument and choose the output to one and two, because this is what the output is on the Scarlet. And then we're going to go to utility, external instrument, and choose stereo. You can also see here, it says the output, Scarlet 2i2 USB, which is the interface that I'm using. And let's hit create. We can also go on external instrument here. So we do this by going down to utility, external instruments, and stereo if you've got a stereo synth or two outputs, and mono if it's just a mono synth. We can choose the MIDI destination, which here it's MicroKorg XL sound, and the MIDI channel, let's leave it on all. And the input, I'm going to choose one and two. Okay, we can hear it there. You might have noticed a crackle sound at the start. That was me adjusting the volume knob. The volume knob has a few slight problems.
Let's just play something in. So you will notice that that data actually recorded itself. I hit record and that recorded it in. Now I'm going to record something that I'm more likely to use. I actually created a filter sound there by using the mod wheel. and I also created a pitch bend. So this will actually record in on the MIDI data, the pitch bend and the modulation wheel. So we can quantize this first of all. So this is all the sound from my microcorg, it's not the sound from Logic. We can also change the velocities of these as well, if we go to the velocity tool. And we can also hit this button and look at some more parameters. So this is from the modulation wheel. We can go through and neaten this up if we wish, or we can choose the pencil tool or draw in new modulations. This way, when we record in our audio from the synthesizer, it will play exactly how we want. If your synth does not have a USB, you can also record with external MIDI, but most modern synthesizers nowadays will have a USB on the back. And let's go on the pitch bend. And here you can see it's also recorded in the pitch bend information. Just going to neaten this up a little bit. And let's just hear this back. So what we need to do now is actually record in the audio. So let's create a new track. Hit audio and choose the input as one and two, the same as the external instrument and output one and two, the same as the external instrument. And it also links up to our interface, the Scarlett 2i2. And hit create, arm the track. We can also mute it as well because when we record this in, we hear both otherwise. Also leave it for a little bit longer in case there's any reverberated sound at the end. Let's just hear this back. And there we go, it's recorded in perfectly in time due to the quantize information and it's also recorded in the changes we made, which were the velocities and neatening up the mod bend and also the pitch bend. So if you've got any external synthesizers, you can actually record them into Logic and you can make sure they're played in perfectly by doing it this way. 
Thank you for watching this lecture. I hope you found it useful and I'll see you in the next lecture.